or men, should I say, would have stayed at his post as a ship was sinking underneath him. He tried to calm the passengers who were coming near to the stage of panic and he tried to calm them with his music and so did the rest of the band for that matter. There we have a scene outside the top of Skipton Road Primitive Church going along towards Cone Cemetery of the Police Hartley Funeral and that depicts two trams along Keithley Road with the people lining the streets at either side and on that day above 40,000 people were in Cone and there has never been as many people in Cone since that day in 1912. This is rather an interesting violin. It was made about 300 yards up the road from here, up in Colne, by Seth Lancaster, who was a friend of Wallace Hartley's, and commemorates the musicians on the Titanic. If you look on the fingerboard here, we see engraved the start of the hymn, Nearer My God to Thee, which is supposed to have been played as the ship went down. And on the back, we have an oil painting of Wallace Hartley, and above it, another one of the Titanic. The violin is known as the Titanic Violin. This is number 92 Greenfield Road, Cole. The house where Wallace Hartley was born on the 2nd of June, 1878. And this is the cemetery cemetery where Wallace Hartley was laid to rest on the 18th of May 1912. This is the hymn service for Sunday, April the 21st, 1912, for the loss of the White Star Line of Titanic in Southampton. Most of the big churches around here tended to have a special memorial service, as did the larger churches like St. Paul's in London and a lot of the other big ones in different cities. The loss of life for the crew was unbelievable. It was very, very high. This is the memorial to the crew of the Titanic, and it was put up by the widows, the mothers, and the friends of the men who died. Now, it hadn't used to be here. It used to be out in the open in Southampton Common, but unfortunately, it got vandalized, and they brought it here to the grounds of Holyrood Church in Southampton for safekeeping. Now, the urn that you see here has been replaced, but one of the good things about this is when they cleaned it up, the detail of the ship, of the Titanic, up at the top, was revealed in spectacular detail. As I thought about commemorating such an event, while I recognize the interest that you all have in this ship, 
and the events surrounding her launch, her voyage, and her sinking. As rector of this city, one of the first things that I learnt when I came here was that here in my parish, in the section of the city known as Northern, there wasn't a single family who didn't lose somebody in that accident. And so when I began to think about what we're doing here today, I remembered the sorrow and the grief of this city. And I reflect that in a seafaring community, it is always well known that no ship is unsinkable. And the great adventure of travel and trade is not without cost. This is the Southampton Memorial to the engineers of the Titanic, the men who kept the lights burning to the last, who stood to their posts, and who to a man died on April the 15th, 1912. I'd like to tell you about this uh, particular brochure. Uh, it was uh, commissioned by the Institute of Marine Engineers Guild of Benevolence for this particular anniversary, the 80th anniversary. Now, uh, the Guild of Benevolence is probably the only sort of direct link of any charity with the Titanic. And when all uh, 36 engineers in the Titanic lost their lives on that terrible night, um, one of the newspapers at the time, I think it was the Daily Chronicle, decided that they would raise funds for the widows and orphans of the engineers who perished. And um, of course, newspapers kind of continually do this. They have other things to do. And they asked the Institute of Marine Engineers, would they kindly take the whole thing on? So for 80 years, uh, our institute has been helping all the dependents of um, not only the Titanic, but the ones that followed on. And we are very proud of this tradition. It is a wonderful, wonderful tr tradition. If it hadn't been for the engineers, there would have been no lights uh, all the period after, a, it, you know, the iceberg and things like that. And they kept the lights, for example, in particular, and not only lights, but other services going. Can you imagine the panic that would have existed if all those lights had been out on that ship? And all those people, they wouldn't have known how to get out of the bowels of the ship. That been, you know, it had been dreadful. So I think the engineers, they did a, an absolute marvelous job. It's a dramatic event. It affected many everybody's lives, particularly here in Southampton, as well as Belfast and Liverpool and London. And I feel that uh, all these events, which wouldn't have happened probably if the ship had been 15 seconds later or 15 seconds earlier, would never have occurred. I mean, the lookout man eventually committed suicide. Um, there were people who run away to start new lives in America. All this makes a story. So with the 1,500 people who perished, you have 1,500 stories. And those who remained, they have stories to tell. Well, although I've never had my father, and I never knew what he looked like. I've always loved him. Um, and it was the Worcester Evening News. There was a picture uh, of three men uh, that lived in Worcestershire that went down on the Titanic. And one of those was my father. And I was 78 years. And when I was looking through it, I was looking at my dad. And I, said, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't read for crying. I was glad I had my lunch first. And uh, I'd gone 78 years and didn't know what he looked like. Well, um, I'm impressed, very impressed uh, by the, the younger generation. Most impressed. I think it's just the whole story of the Titanic, that she was the best or the greatest, the famous uh, liner of the world. And so it's the 80th anniversary, so we came here to celebrate it and to talk, to introduce ourselves, ask questions, talk.